Number three, Daryl Kemp. In June and early July 1957, several women in the Los Feliz neighborhood of Los Angeles reported a peeping Tom. One woman, who was a nurse, said that one night she was lying in bed when a young man burst into her room. He grabbed her purse and then laughed as he walked out of the apartment. The nurse moved out immediately, and her roommate, 24-year-old Marjorie Hipperson, who was also a nurse, was planning on moving out at the end of July. She always locked the door to the apartment, but on the night of July 9, 1957, she forgot to lock the kitchen window. When Hipperson didn't show up for work the next day, her co-workers called her landlady to check on her. The landlady was shocked to see her dead in her bed. Hipperson had been tied up, sexually assaulted, and finally strangled with her own stocking. The police found fingerprints and handprints at the crime scene, and over the next two years, they compared the prints to over 180,000 men. On July 17, 1959, in Griffith Park in Los Angeles, a woman driving her car was stopped by a man pretending to be a park ranger. The man suddenly got out of his truck, and he pulled the woman out of her car by her hair. He dragged her behind some bushes where he tore her clothes off, and then he wrapped a stocking around her neck. He said that he was going to kill her just like he killed the Hipperson woman. The woman passed out, and she awoke to him opening her eyelids, checking to see if she was dead. He then got into his truck, and he planned to run her over, but another vehicle came down the road and scared him away. The woman was able to flag down a car, and she went to the police. She gave a description of the truck, and four hours later, an officer with the Los Angeles Police Department found the truck and arrested its owner, Daryl Kemp. Kemp's fingerprints were compared to the ones found in Hipperson's bedroom, and they were a match. Kemp was born in 1936 in New Jersey, and his family moved to Los Angeles when he was 10 years old. His family said that he had a normal childhood, but in 1951 he was knocked unconscious while playing football, and afterwards his personality changed. His family said that he became strange and moody after the accident. During his trial, he acted bizarre and at times disoriented. Kemp was convicted of the murder of Marjorie Hipperson on New Year's Eve 1959 and he was sentenced to death in February the following year. After a month on death row, Kemp slit his wrist. It required 30 stitches to close the wounds and he survived the suicide attempt. Not long afterwards, Kemp was given his execution date, June 21, 1961. But then two days before he was supposed to be executed, he was given a stay because he was found to be presently insane. That meant that he was sane when the murder happened, but he was now insane so he couldn't be executed. He was transferred to a state hospital and he was declared sane in February 1969. Kemp should have been sent back to death row, but his death sentence had been reversed because of a 1968 ruling from the California Supreme Court. In May 1970, Kemp had to go back to trial, and he was again found guilty, and he was sentenced to death. But he would only stay on death row until 1972. That was when the United States Supreme Court ruled that capital punishment was unconstitutional. So Kemp, and everyone else on death row in America, had their sentences commuted to life, which in California meant that Kemp would be allowed to apply for parole in just a few years. Kemp did apply, and in July 1978, after being incarcerated for almost 19 years, he was paroled. On November 14, 1978, 40-year-old Armida Wiltsey was jogging around the Lafayette Reservoir in Contra Costa County, California. When she didn't pick up her son from school later that day, the police were notified. They found her body a short distance from the jogging path. She had been raped and strangled. The police thought that her killer was a man named Philip Hughes. Hughes was a janitor at a school, and he was a serial killer who strangled to death three women in the area around the same time that Wiltsey was murdered. Hughes was convicted of those three murders in 1980, but he was never charged with Wiltsey's murder. 
In 2000, the LAPD decided to test DNA that was found under Wiltsey's fingernails. They discovered that the DNA didn't belong to Hughes. The police decided to look through Wiltsey's case file to see if they could find someone else to compare the DNA to. The first person to stick out was Daryl Kemp. He had just been paroled three months before the murder, and Kemp lived in the area where Wiltsey was killed. At the time, Kemp was serving a life sentence in Texas for a 1983 conviction for raping and choking several women in their own homes. Luckily, they all survived. So in 2003, the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Department got a blood sample from Kemp. His DNA was a match to the DNA found under Wiltsey's fingernails. In 2008, Kemp, who was 72 at the time, was extradited to California. He was found guilty and he was sentenced to death for a third time. Kemp is currently on death row in San Quentin, which is the same death row he was freed from the first time. Number 2. Donald Henry Gaskins Donald Henry Gaskins was born on March 13, 1933 in Florence County, South Carolina. He was neglected by his mother from a young age and his father was never around. He got the nickname that he would carry with him throughout his whole life, Pee Wee, as a young child because he was always small for his age. He dropped out of school when he was 11 and he formed a gang with two other boys. They would commit petty crimes, but they would also commit terrifying ones, like raping other young boys and gang raping the sister of one of the gang members. When he was 13, Gaskins broke into a house and assaulted a young woman who lived there with an axe. He was sent to a reformatory school, which he escaped from, but would eventually return to, and he stayed incarcerated until the age of 18. After getting out of reformatory school, he got involved in insurance fraud. He would set crops on fire for local farmers in exchange for money. When a farmer's daughter asked Gaskins about his involvement in the fires, he hit her in the head with a hammer and nearly killed her. He was arrested for the assault, and in 1952 he was sentenced to another five years in prison. In 1953, while incarcerated, 20-year-old Gaskins committed his first murder. He killed Hazel Brazel, who was supposedly the toughest guy in the prison. As punishment for the murder, Gaskins ended up spending six months in solitary confinement. After getting out of solitary, Gaskins escaped once and he sliced off the ear of another inmate. As a result, he ended up spending nearly nine years in prison instead of five. On the outside, he continued to commit crimes. He was sent back to prison in 1964 for statutory rape, and he was released again in November 1968. Starting in the summer of 1969, at the age of 36, Gaskins cruised the highway that stretched from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina to Savannah, Georgia, looking for female hitchhikers to kill. By Christmas, he claimed that he had tortured, mutilated, and murdered three young women. However, their bodies were never found. On November 10, 1970, Gaskins began a phase which he called his serious killings. On that night, he raped and killed his 15-year-old niece, Janice Kirby, and her friend, Patricia Ann Allsbrook, who was also 15. He beat them to death with his bare hands because they were drunk and high on drugs. He buried Janice's body and he dumped Patricia's in a septic tank. The next year, he killed Martha Ann Dix, who apparently sold his niece the drugs. He apparently put acid in her bottle of Coca-Cola. Between March 1972 and October 1975, Gaskins murdered at least eight people, including a two-year-old girl, but some people think that the true number of victims is double that. The murders were all terribly gruesome. Some of the victims were mutilated and cannibalized, sometimes while they were still alive. During this time, Gaskins drove a hearse and he would joke that he used it to take victims to his own personal cemetery. It turned out that Gaskins actually had eight bodies buried around his home in Prospect, South Carolina. A friend with knowledge of the bodies told the police about the murders and when the police confronted Gaskins, he led them to where they were buried. Gaskins was convicted of murder and he was sentenced to death on May 27, 1976. 
However, since the death penalty was declared unconstitutional in 1974, Gaskin's death sentence was commuted to life in prison. In the fall of 1980, a man named Tony Simo got in contact with Gaskins. Gaskins happened to be held in the cell next to a man named Rudolf Tyner. Tyner was sentenced to death for killing Simo's parents in a robbery at their store in March 1978. Simo desperately wanted Tyner to be dead, and he was worried that Tyner would get another trial and possibly off death row. So Simo promised to pay Gaskin to kill Tyner. Simo sent Gaskin some poisons and Gaskins gave them to Tyner. But the poisons only made Tyner sick. Two years after Simo first hired Gaskins to kill Tyner, Gaskins got a hold of some C4 and he built a bomb inside of a radio. On September 12, 1982, Gaskins gave Tyner the radio and he told him to plug it in and hold it up to his ear because they would be able to communicate through the radios. Tyner did as he was told and the explosion blew off his hand and part of his head. Gaskin said that the last thing that Tyner heard was him laughing. By this time, South Carolina had reinstated the death penalty. Gaskins, who was called the meanest man in America, was sentenced to death for killing Tyner. Gaskins had kept recordings of his conversations with Simo, so Simo was arrested. He pleaded guilty and he served three years in prison. Gaskins was executed at the age of 58 via the electric chair on September 6, 1991. Donald Henry Pee Wee Gaskins confirmed victim counts 13, but he confessed to killing hundreds and the true number of his victims is unknown. Number 1. Kenneth McDuff Kenneth McDuff was born in March 1946 and he grew up in the small town of Rosebud, Texas. His family was well-to-do and his mother spoiled him. McDuff was a loner and a bully and he was never disciplined. His mother would threaten the teachers and the principal if McDuff ever did get in trouble. He dropped out of school in the ninth grade to work for his father's concrete business. As a teenager, McDuff would break into people's homes looking for women to rape. In 1964, when he was 17 years old, he raped a woman and slashed her throat. She survived and McDuff was never arrested for the assault. However, he was arrested shortly after the attack, but it was for burglarizing another house. He spent a few months in prison and he was paroled in December 1965. After he was paroled, he met 18-year-old Roy Dale Green, who was two years younger than him and also worked for his father. McDuff would brag to Green about his sexual escapades. Many of his stories involved rape and murder. Green was fascinated by the stories, but he just assumed that McDuff was joking. He also thought that McDuff was bluffing about taking him out to rape and murder someone. Nevertheless, on the night of August 6, 1966, McDuff and Green drove from Rosebud to Fort Worth, Texas in the brand new Dodge Charger that McDuff got from his mother as a gift for getting out of prison. They cruised the city and they came across three teenagers, 16-year-old Edna Sullivan, her boyfriend, 17-year-old Robert Brand, and Robert's cousin, 15-year-old Mark Dunham. They were standing by Robert's car, a 1955 Ford. McDuff pulled up near the teens and he grabbed a 38 pistol he had under his seat. He walked up to the teens and forced all three of them into the trunk of Robert's car. McDuff then got into the driver's seat and drove them to an empty field while Green followed behind in his charger. Once they got to the field, McDuff opened the trunk and pulled Edna out. He put her in the trunk of his car and then he went back to Robert's car. He shot both cousins in the face multiple times while they begged for their lives. McDuff and Green drove the charger to another remote area where McDuff raped Edna and forced Green to rape her as well. Finally, they drove her to a third area and McDuff had Edna sit on the road. He pushed her down on her back, sat on her chest, and pressed a broomstick down on her throat while Green held her legs down. They dumped her body on the side of the road and drove off. Green was deeply troubled by the murders and he confessed to the police the next afternoon. McDuff was arrested hours later. Green testified against McDuff and he was sentenced to five years in prison for his part in the murders. 
On November 15, 1966, McDuff was sentenced to die via the electric chair. McDuff came within days of his execution twice, but both times he was granted stays. Then, McDuff's sentence was commuted to life because of the 1972 Supreme Court ruling that temporarily halted executions in the United States. By 1989, the Texas prison system had become dangerously overcrowded, so they were mandated to free a thousand prisoners every week. Amazingly, one of those people was McDuff. He was paroled in September 1989 after spending 23 years in prison. Only nine months after getting out of prison, McDuff was arrested again. He started shouting racial slurs at some African American teenagers and then chased them with a knife. The charges were ultimately dropped because the teens were too afraid to testify and McDuff was released again after spending six months in prison while he awaited the outcome of the charges. Over the next two years, McDuff moved around Texas. He drank heavily and he became addicted to crack cocaine. He also started to kill again. On October 10, 1991, McDuff was at a police roadblock. The police saw a woman inside the car kicking the windshield and she was screaming. McDuff drove away and the police didn't follow him. The police questioned McDuff a few days later and he convinced them that there was no problem. But there was a major problem. The woman in the car was Brenda Thompson, a sex worker. McDuff had killed her and her body wouldn't be found until seven years later. Five days after killing Thompson, another sex worker went missing. 17-year-old Regina Moore was last seen alive in the company of McDuff. Like Thompson, Regina's body wouldn't be found until seven years later. Months later, on December 29th, McDuff and a friend named Alva Hank Worley were out cruising for drugs in Austin, Texas. They ended up kidnapping a 28-year-old accountant named Colleen Reed from a car wash. They both raped her and then McDuff dropped off Worley at the motel where he was living with his daughter. After he dropped him off, McDuff killed Reed and dumped her body. The next to die by McDuff's hand was 22-year-old Valencia Joshua. She was last seen alive on February 24, 1991 and her body was found less than a month later. Then, a week later, on the night of March 1st, McDuff kidnapped 22-year-old Melissa Ann Northup from the convenience store where she worked just south of Waco, Texas. She was a mother of two who was pregnant with her third child. Like all of his other victims, she had been tortured and raped before she was killed. Around the same time, McDuff was wanted for selling drugs to a police informant. He fled the state and a task force was created to track him down. During their search, they came across Worley, and he confessed to raping Colleen Reed with McDuff. The confession led to McDuff being featured on America's Most Wanted on May 1, 1992. Three days later, a woman living in Kansas City, Missouri called the show and said that McDuff was her garbage man. McDuff was arrested later that day in Kansas City. He was convicted of the murder of Colleen Reed and he was sentenced to death for a second time. There was no reprieve for McDuff this time, and he was executed on November 17, 1998, at the age of 52. The police know that Kenneth McDuff killed eight people from 1966 to 1992, but they think he may have been responsible for 14 murders, if not more. Thanks a lot for watching the video, hopefully you found it interesting. If you did, please subscribe, we post a new video every Thursday and Sunday. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, the links are in the description below the video. But that's all for now, thanks again for watching.